as we're thinking about the, the struggle in Vietnam, like you're saying, the, 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 the ideological and in some ways material leadership of the Vietnamese people, at the time you were working with SNCC, um, how did that have an impact on the work that, in the thinking and the work of SNCC at, at that time? Well, I probably the main thing, not only, is it made us feel that we were more internationalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did that immediately in regard to, well, one is that we were one of the first African-American black organizations that came out against the war in Vietnam. Right. And um, didn't quite suffer the problems that Martin Luther King did, mm -hmm. because he and his donor base was a little different than ours. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> so, so there was some overlap. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, uh, <coughs> This whole open up a new area for us, and we in, immediately kind of moved toward Africa in the sense of trying to establish relationships around Pan Africanism, but particularly politically left Pan, -Af Pan Africanism mm -hmm. with all the progressive frontline states, as they were called at that time, mm -hmm. and people like uh, Nieri and, uh, and even Nkrumah and folks like that, mm -hmm. who, who represented the forefront of the African liberation movement. And they were all anti-capitalists. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing quite in Africa like that today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, period. Mm -hmm. and can can you talk about some of like the the the, the reasoning or like so you're, you know the first black organization to come out against it? Why why was that important at the time? Or what was that what was that process like in that organization at that time? I think it started gradually. Some people went to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and, or were influenced by people who went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Or as they started to scratch a little more in terms of black history, uh, they realized that there were older comrades who not were in step necessarily, mm -hmm. <laughs> who were around the 30s, 20s, who had international, like Du Bois, for example, mm -hmm. probably the best known one, mm -hmm. that had, had some degree of international analysis. And so we had been, and King got this particularly, that when he came out against Vietnam, the war in Vietnam, is that uh, you're supposed to just talk about domestic stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. this, this is your area, arena, and for you to talk about international stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we began to disagree with. It, it was a prelude to black power because at one end, we had been brainwashed. I remember as a kid in the 50s, we brainwashed that blacks are 10% of the population, which means that 90% is against you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's when we came up with the idea and we developed the third world concept or deal with people who were talking about that. And instead of um, going to the United Nations and meeting folks like from the, uh, particularly for me, the Algerians, mm -hmm. uh, who because of their own revolution uh, at, that, at that time, and they're talking about a third world, and we're, we're the majority of people in the world. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, your concept of what you can do it being 10%, versus what you can do with being the majority becomes quite different mm -hmm. in terms of what you can imagine and start to put in practice. And I think that whether it was in Africa, whether it was internationally, I mean, ties with uh, both domestically here in mm -hmm. the United States with the Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, I remember when Tijerina first came to New York City, which is mm -hmm. where the left was based, of course, and he, he talked about some place called uh, uh, Tia Monia and revolution in the Southwest. It's like, most evolution in the South was in the United States. You know? mm -hmm. and, but it's a way to meet people and then see their issues, mm -hmm. particularly where they're in struggle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we, like, how do we fit in? How can we help? Mm -hmm. How can we be a part? And I, I just want to say one last thing. Please. Uh, and this came out from my experience in the Venezuela's beginning. And um, in Cuba. Can you say what that is really quick? The Venturemus Brigade was and still is a work brigade of North Americans primarily who go to Cuba to do work as a way of subduing solidarity. Uh, they've cut sugar cane, they've, they've done agricultural work, they've done construction work, and it's kind of declined a little bit in the last bunch of years, but this coming year, 2019, they're going to do the 50th brigade, anniversary of the 50th brigade. Uh, so they're going to try to get at least a hundred people from around the country. And uh, both young and old, people who've never been and the people who went before. 
and to try to set it up in a way that people can stay longer or shorter, not like families or jobs. Uh, it, it, it was a way of making international solidarity real. I mean, you can read about something in a book. Mm -hmm. uh, being in Cuba, you know, getting up in the morning, having to fetch every day, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and then still meet, meet the Cuban work brigades and young people, and mm -hmm. what was great. But the thing I want to say, it goes back to Che, and then two, three, yeah. I remember being, there was a commandante who came to our work camp one day. They started talking, and then Che came up, and he, he said, you know, Che was a little upset around the two, three Vietnam statements. Yeah, he came out, because he felt that the left was being too dilettante -ish. They were having conferences around non-alignment, or conferences around fighting imperialism. But they weren't actually fighting imperialism. They were out, out, in, out in the jungle, in the field. Mm -hmm. and, and it was important to, to get the Yankee imperialists to feel it in their gut, to, mm -hmm. to force them to expand. Right now, most of their forces were going to fight the Vietnamese. Right. How about spreading it out to fight other people? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and taking up. So he, it was a real challenge to the left mm -hmm. to, to basically put your mouth, I mean, put your body where your mouth is. Uh, I thought that was really very important. Thank you. I want to come back to some of those points, but I think Claude, I want to bring you in here and talk about some of the media work you were doing at the time, and particularly as it relates to what George Jackson called the prison movement at that time, and the, how the international struggle was. And, and yeah, I want to speak to Talia's question a little bit about this. The, the telling of a different story, to put it crudely, um, and, and uh, what that work was like in that period. I mean, it was pretty challenging then, too. Um, uh, I mean, I, I started doing media work when I was 18. Um, I was a student at Cal, and there was a third world strike, and I wasn't going to class, and I ended up doing radio journalism. Um, and the kind of control of messaging, on one hand, is pretty consistent. Uh, for example, uh, speaking of George Jackson, I was part of the first uh, group of journalists invited after he was murdered into St. Quentin for a PR tour of the prison, you know, to show us where it all came down. And uh, was such, a, you know, it was a, a typical propagandizing of what happened when in fact we had been doing a tremendous amount of work both putting his voice on the air but interviewing a lot of people in the prisons during that period of time and had developed both relationships with people inside but also were putting their voices out on the radio and in the case of San Quentin and Folsom, uh, those people were able to listen so we became a, a place, the program that I worked on became a kind of focal point for communication about stuff. But it was also internationalist, very much in keeping with the kind of politics that were exemplified by George Jackson, but by no means limited to people like him. And so, uh, to me, that there were a lot of personal lessons in that. In terms of my own growth and development, I was, you know, in 1971, or when Marin happened in 1970, I was 20. Mm -hmm. So it was a very formative period of time for me. Not that that was the beginning of my political development, but in a real way, the kind of intersection with what we felt viscerally were world-shattering events. Um, and a lot of people disagreed because there was an attempt to totally marginalize that messaging as well. Um, different period than, than now. I mean, there was no web. And yet, uh, when the, when the uh, U.S. started um, uh, bombing campaigns in, in Indochina, particularly Laos, and Cambodia, in addition to Vietnam, when uh, Kent and Jackson states happened, we were at the core of developing a network of communication um, 
uh, with campuses all over the U.S. because there was so much going on at that period of time and found ourselves uniquely in a position to really bicycle information around. Um, and I don't know, that to me that was like the, con the literally the connection between the world exploding on the outside and what was happening internally. Um, if I could just throw yeah, something please. real quick out. Yeah. Uh, there was a magazine called Scanlons, mm -hmm. which uh, put out an issue about guerrilla warfare in the U.S. from 1965 to 1970. And because I know we were focusing on 68, I uh, took this magazine that was actually banned in the U.S., was forced to be published and printed in Canada. And I went through and I copied all of the actions that happened internal to the U.S. in 1968. And there are roughly 120 acts of sabotage of various kinds, some of which were against property and some of them were attacks on the police. And I'll pass it around. Uh, there wasn't a week where there wasn't something going on that reflected the level of militant struggle and warfare that was happening externally. So there was something very prescient about the kind of crisis of imperialism in that period that was being embraced internally, some by organized forces and a lot by just small groups that never took credit for what they did. So I'll pass it around, people can look at it. Um, you know, the details aren't important, it's just sort of impressive to think that 120 things in a year so that, you know, do the math, it's like virtually every week something was going on. And I'm not saying everything that happened was focused on, you know, stopping the war in Vietnam, for example, but in some way, at, at, during every week, there was a militant act that tried to exacerbate the internal crisis of the United States. And, and of course, this happens in the same period that there were, was emerging revolutionary organizations. Certainly, I mean, Phil mentioned stuff in terms of the uh, uh, black liberation struggle. I mean, you had um, um, Republic of New Africa is formed in 68. You've got, the RAM is happening and starts, I think, 62. Um, but uh, also, you know, this is a period when, in 1969, Alcatraz is, is occupied for 18 months uh, as part of drawing attention to indigenous struggle and issues of land. Um, Chicano Mexicano movement, the moratorium happens in LA in 1970, but that doesn't come out of thin air. There's a level of organizing that is of an internationalist nature that connects to Cuba, that connects to what's happening in Latin America in that same period. Um, Puerto Rican independence movement, of course, is active from its inception in 1898, but again in the 50s, with labor organizing, the emergence of the Nationalist Party, and then it, actually a level of continued uh, armed resistance from the Puerto Rican independence movement that reemerges in the, in the mid-70s. So all this is happening, and so um, it was hard to like not think about taking a stand and getting involved, which of course ultimately I did that and ended up doing both clandestine work, but also prison. But there's so much happening. It's not the same now. And some of the possibilities, you know, there's not a template. This isn't a call to anything really. But uh, a friend of mine who's a political prisoner has this saying, and he says, the, the state will not ever reach a moral epiphany and change. And so if that's what you believe, then your long-term thinking has to be both visionary and imaginative, but you have to be willing to accept some reality to the issue of conflict if we really want to transform the world. Speaking of national liberation, people, um, 
free themselves in unity with other people, so whatever, but freeing themselves from the bonds of racist, capitalist exploitation. I'm curious, both of you are involved in work that I understand how a bit of that framework, if not a lot of it. Um, and I'm curious, thinking about, um, yeah, how do you all think about that work in thinking about this moment that we are studying? Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me. I feel very comfortable in this space and learning um, <coughs> a lot from hearing how everybody in the room. So. Um, a little bit about Hola is we are primarily, I know how it's Koreans in the diaspora, most of us are queer, um, most of us are dispossessed from our language, and so, you know, and most of us are anti authoritarian, anti capitalist. So the concept of nationalism in the nation state is problematic. Um, and understanding that, like the patterns that we've seen the older generation here in the U.S. in order to succeed in becoming the neoliberal citizen on behalf of the U.S. has just kind of forced us to be really critical of that. Um, and so, on one hand, you know, what it, where does that leave us um, in diaspora and the connection we make? and uh, colonial, colonial. Um, in terms of how we're inspired though and how we come together, how we form an identity, sort of culturally. Um, you know, in, in thinking about this the thing of the series of things, I can't help but appreciate one of our partners in the book, uh, the resistance, which is get unity. Um, we look to groups like them because they have a similar struggle to us in that um, you know, okay, thinking about this timeline, I was trying to contribute some stuff yeah, yeah. about my people's history, and it was a little challenging. Um, it was a little challenging to contribute in this linear sense of like people who can struggle and don't get inspired by it. Um, and I say that because. In the north, where we were kind of denied information about what was happening in the north during this period, and we get little bits and pieces, and it's really beautiful and inspiring. It's land reform, it's land redistribution, it's you know the ruling class being kicked out, and their big palatial spaces being turned into penal centers for peasants and workers for living in the So we get submitted to this, but we. You know, we're primarily tied to wanting, being hungry for learning about social media and sound. So, and in 68, you know, for that period that we were discussing, uh, that that is just so repressed by people who have survived this war, the Korean War ended in 53, uh, military dictatorships completely silenced people. And so the, the organizing that was happening there was very, it was um, hard to obtain information on my parents would be completely silent about it. They were so terrified about speaking about it through the trauma. But Korean nationalists really helped stoke the movement building that we eventually did learn about, which didn't erupt for us until the late 70s. So on one hand, we do very much appreciate how um, a nationalist struggle in Korea helped us arrive to learning about kind of um, Korean struggles that for like you know there's several that I can name some of them you are I don't know how familiar people are with Korean um, movement history work but you know our Paris of 68 is Kwangju in 1980 you know um, and if you really wanted to compare them, you could see why, you know, under such brutal repression, finally, you know, not really understanding what's happening, like, you know, not really seeing what's happening, and then all of a sudden you've got an insurrection. How does that happen, <laughs> you know? So on one hand, we do credit, you know, the, the, the utility of this kind of nationalist movements, and, and investigating that a little bit more, you know, what we've realized is 
the nationalists and the independent movement and the guerrilla fighters in the north, you know, they were organizing for their self-determination and liberation. And that was just a, a framework in which they could identify and they could contrast that to living under Japanese colonial occupation or um, feudalism or, you know, getting back to an agrarian lifestyle where they could go back to um, the original rebellions in the late 1800s by the peasants and things like that. Um, so anyway, I guess that's a short, <laughs> we can get more into yeah. it, um, but yeah, I'll leave it here. Everybody here is thinking about further questions. Yeah, it would, it would help me to talk about this in conversation, so sorry if that was a little bit late. Yeah, so I guess for me, I tend to work backwards, so I'm going to work backwards from 68 till now. Um, you know, 68 um, for the Palestinian liberation, um, the national liberation movement, was really a critical time and period for us because it is when you see um, the emergence of um, Fatah, you know, in 65, for example, the PFLP or the Shabi and, and these movements um, that were um, had you know um, social platforms and you know things like art and writing and you know talking about discursive memory. I mean, by '68, you have a generation of Palestinians who have been born outside of Palestine. Um, and so their parents often were the ones who were displaced in 48, and they're usually still alive. So, you know, in 67, with, um, you know, it's called the Six Day War often, but, you know, the insurgency of an, an occupation by the Zionist entity, by Israel, into what is now the West Bank in Gaza, um, and of course the Golan Heights, right? This really produced um, a new um, kind of sober assessment of what the reality was for us as Palestinians now that um, 48 isn't just taken, but the entire um, area of historic Palestine is now under occupation, what does that mean? So you see this rise um, of these different political groups that have, you know, when we see Lena Khaled's uh, interview, for example, I mean, she is in an office where Ghassan Kenafani sat, who, and he was a writer, but his work was political, right? About how do we talk about memory so that we don't just fight for this land, but we remember who we are and we can you know, continue to produce um, this identity, right? Being Palestinian is not just cultural, it's a political identity and it's our connection to the land. Um, and so, um, you know, in that you see um, also, uh, you know, this call for armed resistance and um, thousands of Palestinian youth all around the world dropping their university and scholarships and disenrolling from school and heading to uh, camps where they were learning how to fight. Um, and so, and this of course doesn't happen on its own, you know, the, the beauty of talking about, um, you know, seeing this from an internationalist framework is that um, we learned from others, you know, we were inspired by Algeria, we were inspired by um, you know, revolutionary movements um, across the world and um, in Indochina and, and in Latin America and we learned from each other um, and so there was really like a, a kind of a transactional um, learning that was happening between um, our people and others who were resisting settler colonialism and colonialism at that time um, and so I think you know, for me on this timeline, I, I see also the Battle of Gurame, which is really important because it is for us one of the most, it is the place where, um, you know, the Palestinian resistance was able to defeat at a very high cost the Israeli army. It's one of the only places where we were able to stand our ground. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, whatever we were trying to do by liberating the through armed resistance has, um, I would say, failed at this point because what we're seeing is a continual occupation and intensifying occupation of the land and furthering apartheid of the people within it. And the situation for us as refugees, you know, 
was talking about an identity of diaspora, I mean, you know, we are people who are defined by being diasporic and protracted. Um, and so, um, protracted refugee, but rather, and so, um, yeah, we just see um, a worsening situation for those of us who are in the diaspora, and now we just hit our 70th year mark um, of being displaced, right? And so I think for the Palestinian youth movement, I mean, we arose in, internationally, actually, in 2006, um, and for youth, we mean folks between the age of 18 and 35. And why did we reestablish? Why did we establish ourselves? Because the question for Palestinians of trying to create a state outside of the land, outside of the state, you know, creating a structure of society that kind of holds everybody together, um, especially you know, that was the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, where we had unions, we had. Um, you know, student unions, workers' unions, um, uh, women's unions, right? And so you're creating a parliament, right? And so it's creating this body that has, that can function in diaspora, but always looking to return. In the Oslo period in 1993, that's really what we at QIM say is, is the birth of our movement, because 93 is when the PLO basically you have the introduction of the PA, which someone mentioned earlier, the Palestinian Authority, which is supposed to be a five-year temporary government um, until 97 when the state will be formed, whatever that means. And basically, you have a dropping of arms in 93, a people going to the table as representatives of the people, whatever that means, and signing onto um, you know, agreements state by state when we have no state and uh, we dropped one of the most valuable aspects of our resistance which was the call to arms which was um, mass arguments of our people so I think for PYM it's um, our focus is to try to create a forum where we as Palestinian youth can um, talk about what we're going to do who we are what we're trying to build and really look back home as we're building um, for return right until return to liberation. Um, and just I think something that is like inspired from, from this timeline, um, and I think like I, I, I know it's just kind of like a short and very dense intro, but I think for, um, for us right now, one of the biggest campaigns we're involved in internationally is with the sanctions. Um, because, and PYM is the coordinator of that in the United States, of the umbrella, but basically, um, calling on the Palestinian Authority to lift the sanctions on Gaza, um, you know, as being an arm and as collaborating with the Zionist state, as with the Zionist entity, which is controlling the siege and occupation, etc. Right? Why do we have people who look like us, talk like us, speak like us, who were revolutionaries at one point, right, or the Fatah, who are now arms of the colonial government, right? Um, and we have a mass prisoner strike happening right now. Um, and I was telling Claude earlier, I mean, we have mass factionalism now, unfortunately, in the Palestinian community. But in prison, that's where we have unity. Because um, political prisoners still speak as a unified bloc, and every faction is on hunger strike now. We have members of every faction on hunger strike um, commenting, and, and standing up against what's happening to people right outside the prison walls um, and to them as well.